We have Alyssa Iris. She is one of the top uh, academics in US on India, uh, an academic of great repute. And her latest book has come out, Our Time Has Come, How India Is Making Its Place in the World. So we'll just have a small conversation with her. Uh, Alyssa, uh, you know, in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of pessimism about India in the US. And now we see a greater degree of optimism uh, about India. Uh, and a lot of good things are said about India. Uh, the pessimism was, of course, misplaced, uh, but is the optimism also somewhat misplaced? Well, it's not just the 50s and 60s. I mean, I think you uh, had some pessimism about India's direction through the 70s, early 80s even. Mm. Um, there has been more optimism about India's growth trajectory since the onset of economic reforms. I think what is happening now is India is really envisioning a larger global role for itself, mm -hmm. a new and different type of role on the world stage. Now, is that overly optimistic? I don't think so. I think we're actually seeing the country carve out for itself its own specific India as a leading power type of global role. I don't think that's overly optimistic. I think that's just a recognition of reality. But, uh, you know, in some of your writings, you've been saying that India always tends to punch much under its weight, not as much according to its waist, uh, much less above its waist, weight. Uh, now, uh, do you think that uh, that is a kind of a realism in India uh, that, you know, uh, it's probably a little premature for us to actually start punching according to our weight, much less above our weight, uh, because you know there's a lot of other priorities we need to take care of before, while of course there's a lot of talk about how India's influence has to reach all over the mm -hmm. globe, but we must stay within our certain limits. Uh, do you think that is really the case or do you think we are being rather diffident? Now, my book makes the argument, I make the argument very explicitly that I think it is entirely possible and what we are seeing is an India that will still continue to struggle with the many domestic challenges that it faces. These are well known and obvious to anybody who has grown up and lived mm -hmm. here or certainly anybody who's ever visited India. Mm -hmm. um, but at the very same time, you see a country that has now emerged as one of the world's largest economic powers. If India does overtake uh, the UK and France in terms of the size of its economy this year, as has been uh, estimated. If not by, this, then the next. Right. This is happening as mm -hmm. we speak. I mean, that puts India in the top five global economies. That's mm -hmm. a real economic heavyweight. India is taking on new and different roles as a result. The, the, the emergence of India as a regional uh, net provider of security in the Indian Ocean region. Again, this is uh, a new and larger, very specific role that India is taking on in this region. But tell me something, you know, uh, there's relations between the U.S. and India, uh, at least at the public level, were always very good. You know, America was India's aspiration. The middle class never looked to Russia or anywhere else. America was the ideal. Uh, but the so government they, looked to Russia. Yeah, but, you know, there were certain compulsions on uh -huh. that count. And, uh, but over the last 15, 20 years, both the public as well as, you know, the governmental uh, way of the way we look at the U.S. has changed completely. Uh, but uh, my question really is, what is the U.S. looking for in this relationship? What are its expectations from India? And uh, what do you think are India's expectations from the U.S.? And I don't mean, you know, this business about give us technology. That's, that's crap. Uh, I'm talking about the big picture. Uh -huh. Uh, do you think there's clarity uh, as far as that relationship is concerned? I think at the 30,000 foot level, the United States is looking to have a partnership with the world's largest democracy that will be focused on uh, upholding the liberal international order. Now, India has become much more vocal about issues, particularly in the Asia Pacific, freedom of navigation, uh, upholding the rule of law. Uh, these are, are values that both countries share, and they are also tenets of international order that both countries want to ensure remain the way they are. That's another reason why I've argued in the book that you know, India is looking for the global order to make space for a larger Indian role, mm -hmm. for a bigger voice. But it's not looking to overturn the, the global order. It's not a revisionist power in that sense. It's looking for its own space, but doesn't want to turn everything upside down. Now, what is India looking for from the United States? Uh, assistance, 
in its own economic transformation, a recognition of the role that it should be playing globally. I think India is also looking to the United States, and I've argued that the U.S. should be doing more on this front for the U.S. to take more of a lead on helping India gain entry in some of these institutions that don't accommodate it yet. Well, some of those institutions one can understand, but yeah. you know, there's something called the global high table. Uh, it's a pretty small table. I don't think anybody wants to extend the table, which means this you is know, an issue. Exactly right. Somebody right. has to, you know, reform start is hard. Somebody loses by expanding, mm -hmm. right? So the if the table grows larger, do some people feel that their interests are threatened? Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the challenge with UN Security Council reform. The United States has vocally supported Indian membership in specifically a reformed and expanded UN. Yeah, Security but vocal Council. support the U.S. Yes, but there would yeah. be others who probably, you know, who no longer pull the kind of weight they did. Uh, when you know the UN came up, uh, the world has changed yeah. since 1945. Well, that's exactly right. I'm sure there would be a lot of countries which would be reluctant to make, although although vocally yeah. or at least publicly, their position is something else. Uh, but you know, we know the games they've played since the 17th century. Uh, well, I, I think I, that's I, part of the challenge, and mm. I think that, you know you don't see reform happening with any vigor or any speed at all in mm. the UN. So this is a real issue for India, mm. and. Despite the fact that India has grown economically, that it is taking on a larger security role, uh, it's a major peacekeeping contributor to the UN, it hasn't been able to carve out that space and see reform of an institution that uh, it has long deserved it. So, I mean, that's part of the challenge and where I think the U.S. can be helpful, uh, but the U.S. needs to be much more active on this front. Okay, uh, the last question. I know you're in a bit of a rush. Uh, you know, uh, very often we hear in Washington that uh, India and uh, U.S. have a 95% convergence east of India, but probably only a 5% convergence west of India. And we're talking about what is my favorite country, Pakistan. Pakistan. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see that play out as we go along? Because there seems to be some correction coming into the U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Pakistan. Do you think uh, that policy will actually change uh, from what it has been in the past? Uh, which was what I call an abused wife syndrome, that the Pakistanis can do everything. But ultimately, the Americans think that maybe it's better to keep the relationship going rather than break it off. Or do you think, uh, uh, you know, under President Trump, uh, things could reach the break point? We will have to see what happens in the coming months with the new announcement from the Trump administration that we will be now scoping down and ending security assistance to Pakistan. Now, what they have chosen to do is freeze security assistance, uh, holding that out as a possibility for distribution at a later point if Pakistan then decides to take action against some of the many terrorist groups that are operating from its soil. Do you think they will? We have to see. Uh, I think this is. And been, if they don't, this has been a request of longstanding, and what you are seeing now in the United States is an exasperation with the fact that, you know, incentives haven't really been persuasive, disincentives haven't been persuasive enough. Uh, so how can the United States create a context that is more persuasive to see action on this? So front? this is the problem. I right. would have left, let you go, but you know, it's always you're very provocative, so I have to ask you the next question which is that um, if the aid uh, suspension doesn't work, uh, as I'm a little skeptical on how much yeah. it will work, yeah. uh, then is this like basically the only option? Or do we then see the US go up on that escalation ladder of some kind of sanctions, et cetera, et cetera? Or uh, yeah, this, this is, is where it all ends. I mean, it's, this is a hypothetical question. So I, I truly don't know what the administration plans to do. You've seen a report that came out last year, authored by Lisa Curtis, who is now serving mm. in the Trump administration, and former Ambassador Hussein Haqqani. They have laid out a series of possible escalatory steps. Mm. Now, whether those will be steps followed by the administration, I don't know the answer to that, uh, and only time will tell. I think the question before everybody is how will this relationship unfold in the coming months. Uh, that really is what I think everybody is looking at. Thanks a lot, Elisa. Thank you.